than the high-end guys that make for global luxury brands. The worst samples with the crappiest communication, I was appalled. You know, starting the automotive brand and, and they're both now like globally known. My cars are like a quarter mil to a million plus. Jonathan Ward, a serial entrepreneur and craftsman who started two successful automotive and a garment brand of his own. And recently he launched his leather goods company. He is one of the most skilled multi-craftsmen I have ever met. Let's hear what he has to share. The passion that drives you is the most important thing. Hello everyone, welcome to the Leathertainment Studio Podcast. We have Jonathan today. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur, um, designer, craftsman, uh, a person who has many skills and wears many hats. And we're going to discuss the challenges of making a leather brand, creating a leather brand from scratch, and the challenges of making leather goods in the USA. So welcome, Jonathan, here. Can you introduce yourself to us? What, what are you doing? What have you been doing? And how are you coming into the leather industry. All right. Well, my uh, full name is Jonathan Ward. I live here in Southern California. I am an industrial designer, mostly known for my automotive brands. I have two custom automotive brands, one called Icon and another called TLC. And I think my whole life, ever since I was a little kid, I've just been a serial craftsman. So obviously, like most American boys, it starts with Legos and you know, goes from there. And I always found myself like taking things apart and understanding the way they're made and then evolving them or breaking them and then trying to fix them. Rarely successful. And I love like lost arts, especially, you know, things that are really about the finesse, engaging all your senses. So I haven't, you know, I've studied pre-Raphaelite painting and sculpting and I've done high-end woodworking and furniture making and watch design and on and on and on. But I think I really like taking those passions. You know, I think first you, you have the passion, then you have to develop the skill set for a while and just focus on that using other people's patterns or deconstructing things, whatever. Then next phase, developing my own design language and turning them into brands. So this new leather venture uh, is a case in point, and so is a new apparel brand I just started called Campfire Coats. The uh, leather brand is called J Word Collection. Uh, the J it allows it to be flexible, so I can give my wife credit mostly for tolerating and enabling me and keeping me on a leash. And uh, yeah, it's been pretty pretty exciting, pretty fun road. That's super interesting, the background you have. I've never seen a leather person in the industry that that has a car making skill and background, which is you know quite different, like engineering and, and crafting. Um, probably I'm going to ask uh, quite a bit of, about that, like how that relates or you know compare and contrast, like the challenges or similarities between two lines of work. Um, but this is going to be a fun conversation. So um, I think we can get into that topic as we discussed earlier, like what are the challenges you're facing now being a serial entrepreneur? You know, I'm, I'm assuming creating a car brand of your own wasn't easy. Now you're getting into leather, uh, creating a leather brand and it, it is challenging. What challenges are you facing that that's different than other things you have experimented before and probably it will be helpful for other people, which are many I know that trying to create their own brands today. Well, I think, you know, starting the automotive brand and, and they're both now like globally known. Uh, I never thought it was easy, but in retrospect, as I start these new ventures, I'm realizing that, you know, let's call it web 3.0, like where we are today when it comes to getting eyes on your product is definitely much larger challenge than it was when I started because the, uh, the first automotive brand, I started basically at the birth of this thing people were calling the intranet, you know? So we actually traded like the fourth or fifth vehicle that we sold for, through that brand, TLC, for a website. Uh, a guy was a budding web designer and he said, have you heard of these things called websites? I said, yeah, I think that could be really cool. You know, and the reality was the internet at that time was 
wild and free. And you, if you specialized in something, I think it would have been much more difficult if it was like a general automotive repair and it wasn't like sniper specific, but it was fairly easy to organically without me really putting any effort into it other than having a halfway decent website to find an audience and gain a following and then repeat clients and then media and then uh, referrals and sort of what I've always anticipated is sort of the natural path. What I'm realizing now, though, is that it's overly romantic to think, oh, if you make something beautiful, people will come. I don't feel that's the case today, uh, especially when, I mean, the everything in, in, in getting eyes on, you know, through to Instagram, especially lately, it's so what I call like gamified. Everything's turning into a subscription model or a rev model. And it's not what it used to be, which was allowing creators to share and connect and find audiences, not even necessarily consumers. You know, now it's all about the money. So it's, it's much more difficult and much more costly to build it. And then the other challenge, you know, with the automotive brand, what we were doing with both brands was so novel and went against the mainstream trends that we realized, okay, we just have to internalize almost everything. We, we have to not rely on subcontractors. We have to make it all ourselves. But being in Southern California, it's a horrendously unrealistically litigious and complex business environment. So when I got into the idea of transitioning the leather goods from a hobby into a brand, I was like, okay, now I, especially in California, like the workman's comp rate for someone rowing, running a sewing machine is like one of the highest rates. Like really give me a break. So I was like, all right, I need to subcontract. It. So again, develop my skills, saddle stitch, hand dye, burnish, finish, fill a tooth crease, like develop all that. I studied with, with multiple specialists in, in a couple different countries, which was damn fun and it's all right. But then I know, you know, I have 50 employees with the automotive brand. I, I kind of got a job. Right. I missed the hands-on craft because when Icon was a younger brand, I was out on the floor all day. I was welding and panel beating and stitching and wiring and, and deeply involved in a tactile craftsman's sense. But at this scale of the brand, I'm, you know, more in my office and doing renderings and sales and marketing and product planning. But I started to really miss that. Just what I love is that idea sketch, like uh, my version of like sheep jumping a fence to fall asleep. I'm like building a model, almost like a 3D CAD model in my brain and rotating it around and changing that chamfer and adding more surface tension and like building it out. I love that. Then I could literally go to my studio in my house, sketch it out or do it in CAD, hand cut it and make it without relying on anyone. Me, my dogs, good podcast, good music. And just, I love the Zen of that. But if you're going to make it a brand, I mean, I don't want to say this applies to everyone, right? If it's an Etsy brand and it's onesies, twosies, great. If you're comfortable with and drawn to click it, stitch it and ship it. Okay. Maybe. But if you really a, a, an idiot geek like me and, and you want to like get super granular on the details and revive traditional burnish finishes and all of that, it's very difficult to build a team uh, and to scale in California. And I was shocked how hard it was to find a supplier. Crazy hard. That care. Well, in in US, this is like trying to make it or find a supplier in the US, I think. It's it's an almost impossible level of complexity for my experience so far, but I would like to hear it from you what what you if you tried what you have found. And it's also not easy in the rest of the world, the, which is a common craft, you know, a lot more common than US. Uh, there are a lot more people, a bigger talent pool, you know, affordable and all that. So uh, it kind of ties into that 
made in America aspect, which I know, I think you're passionate about. You make your cars here and all that stuff. And that's probably the biggest additional crease and challenge into figuring this out. So let's talk about that made in America leather goods uh, experience you had so far. Yeah, at inception, that was what I wanted to do because that's what I do with the apparel brand. That's what I do with automotive. I feel that uh, a big part of why uh, America uh, grew and had the respect of the world, más o menos, depending on the time and, and politics, uh, was that we were risk takers. We were innovators. We were MacGyvering our way through things and figuring it out. But in the leather world, um, I was I was really bummed out. I, I had five samples made from three of the top sets of samples. So the three what are considered top American subcontract firms and then two small shops. Well, let's say I reached out to all of them. Two of them said, eh, not our thing. If you just, you know, want us to click it, stitch it, throw it in a box, we're your guy. You know, we do wallets for this motorcycle brand and yada, yada, yada. And they sent me samples. And there's just nothing about craftsmanship left. It's just, it's just don't give a darn, kick it out. Not my scene. Then the high-end guys that make for global luxury brands, the worst samples at the highest fee in the longest timeline with the crappiest communication, I was appalled. Uh, I then had samples made in India, Mexico, Colombia, and they were all better. Then I, throughout my life, I feel like I try and be really open, you know, like talk to anyone, explore different things because I call it like lily pads, right? You don't know how you're going to get across the lake, but you just got to make that first step. And then you meet someone and it can just be a chance meeting and it turns into a shared interest or another introduction. And, and I've been blessed by that. So specifically with leather goods, I was kind of licking my wounds and figuring out Oh boy, maybe I need to tool up and get another big warehouse and, you know, start my own production, et cetera. And, and I knew how difficult that was going to be having been there, done that. And I have friends in like luxury high-end shoe bag leather world that built their own teams and had factories here in Southern California and the, the real estate and the insurance rates and all the other regional dynamics forced them out. Uh, one of the most successful ones moved to Leon, Mexico, which is a great town, ton, tons of history. Um, some really good tanneries there. They, they've been really up in their game. But the stitch samples I had made there from shops large and small, they just didn't want to spend the extra time and intention. So uh, during COVID, my wife was fighting breast cancer. During therapy for that chemo, she they discovered another type of cancer so it was a super rocky road for us especially i mean for her um but it meant that we were pretty much locked down at home because of her immune system that could you know especially at that time so i really accelerated dialing in my tech packs i produced little videos um nothing fancy but to communicate the technique of burnishing and the, the, the ointment that I like to use for it and why a crease and a, a beveled edge matters to me and on and on and on. And then my wife's doing great to celebrate a year of cancer free. We had like this crazy fun month long trip planned in Italy. Uh, all sorts of stuff. planned. On like the second day of the trip, we're visiting a friend in uh, Ile de Alba. And we get on his boat to go to this cool spot for lunch. Some like freak wake wave, like ghost ship. We're like, we don't know what the hell, because there was no other boats out. Hit our bow. And my wife was up there. Basically, she broke her back and broke her shoulder. So this turned into like an opera of absurdities of me, like the, you know, big COVID problem there still. So they wouldn't even let me into the hospital. 
I am sitting on the ground, hoping my phone doesn't die, doing like serious triage with friends in, around the world. Some that do like, you know, military medical evac just by coincidence, trying to come up with a plan to get her the heck off this island once we get a diagnosis. So long story short, Friends F1 team loaned us their helicopter. We had the helicopter go to Milan, get the brace that on this island, they didn't even have any of the braces that she needed for transit. We helivac off the roof of the hospital, got checked into a hospital in Milan. She had surgery and we were, I checked in as well. We kind of falsified documents. I, I had a cane at the time because it had my knee replaced, but I was fine, but I didn't want her to be alone. So uh, we got a room at the hospital and I was going nuts. And, you know, it's funny thing. One of your friends and uh, previous guest Peter Nitz, kind of save my sanity because I had been curious about him, but hadn't really subscribed or gotten into it. So I got a subscription and I just burned through every single thing Peter ever did. And like the music and, and softness and pace of it was like super calming. And it, it, it really helped fill the time. But during that time, I realized the Lena Pell show was happening in Milan. So I turned to my wife one morning and I'm like, Peace out. I'll bring you back like some sushi or something to break up the hospital food. I got to go to this. And I wanted to go because I wanted to get direct with some of my favorite European tanneries that I'd been buying more and more quantities of, but through U.S. dealers at crazy markups. And that was really my main goal. Um, when I travel, all the bags and most of the clothes um, I, I have with me, I've made anyway. So I took... Um, one of my bags and some samples uh, with me went to the show, made tons of connections. And I happened to see this booth of like a white label manufacturing firm when the samples were just on point, like night and day better than anything I had seen. So I just kind of walked up and spoke to the first person who made eye contact, went through a nice long meeting. It's great. This, this could really work out. I'd, how do, what's the deal? What do we do next? I have all my own tech packs. I have everything. They're like, well, yeah, you know, uh, MOQ, I think was 600 units minimum order per colorway. And I was like, uh, okay, well, been really nice meeting you, but like, I don't know who's playing that, especially new brands. That's like not the new world order and just isn't going to work. So ciao, ciao. I turned around to walk away happenstance the owner of the tannery and it's a multiple generation family and uh, not not tannery i'm sorry production facility happened to be walking through the booth and he came up and the rep introduced me to him and he goes wait a minute i know you you're the you're the icon guy crazy small world so he knew of my vehicle brand and a friend of his i believe in russia had two of them and he's like what are you doing here? Are you looking for, you know, interiors? You know, we don't do automotive. I said, no, 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 no. So I showed him my sample and explained the story. He turned back to the rep and goes, no problem. You know, for, forget about our minimums. Like this guy understands brand. He's committed. He's very well known in the luxury space. Like we'll wave it all. Let's, let's build something together. So I was floored and they turned out to be such a wonderful partner like organized, like all my Italian friends, the last thing they want to do is work, right? It's like four hour lunches, seven hour dinners. Oh, let's take a nap. But, but they, they, they so contradicted that stereotype. We, we had a full team on the development. The biggest disruption was when you make in Italy, you need to, you want to source everything in Italy, all your hardware, all your zippers, your lining, stiffers, you name it. If it's all sourced in Italy, the export paperwork and the Italian incentives place are significant for export if it's all Italy. Unlike the big business side where made in Italy, as we all know, really doesn't mean much. 98% of the bag or 99% of the leather good can be made in Asia or wherever and then brought to Italy and like they attach the, the fob on the zipper. Hello, I made in Italy. Oh, Nick, I discovered that same BS with uh, Swiss made watches when I had my watch made in Switzerland. They pretty much subcontract and mark it up to you, which kind of sucks. But 
we had weekly Zoom meetings, samples back and forth. We had, you know, I was mandating the SPI and stuff. And like we identified, I'd always loved Los Tavali Tannery. So right away, I wanted to work with them. The only bummer is they don't have a like a dark, beautiful blue veg hide that's right for my work. And I, I'm going to develop that with them as we get more traction. They'd send, you know, stitching samples and, you know, do you want an angle stitch? Do you want a Japanese style point stitch? And on and on and on. And edge burnish samples. We, this is done this way, this way, this way, this way. And, you know, it, it took a fair bit, but it progressed week by week. And by the time we signed off on everything and got my first uh, production order, not one blemish, not one error. Uh, and you know, it's, uh, I'm, sh I'm sure I'm paying way more than I could get, but I value what I'm getting and e everything I do. I'm a, that, that's what drives me to do it is, is the finesse and the detail. And they were open. They're like, you know, burnishing. They're like, yeah, I think we have the wheels and some of the tools and machines for that. But I mean, we haven't used them for at least 10 or 15 years. Like everyone's edge painting. Personally, I think edge painting is BS, like it's luxury for the manufacturer because it's quick, boom, boom, and it's going to wear out in a year if you actually use it. So you throw it away and come back and buy another one, which just like the automotive world is highly corrupted by make it good enough to last through the lease, but make enough content in it like the touch screen that's worn out by then. So darn expensive, you throw it away and you consume. I hate that. Like I love the traditions of industrial design when the quality is what drove it. You made it the best you could to last as long as possible and provide the most value. And it's sad to me in how many industries that is just dead. So oh. I traveled back and forth to Italy a couple times during development, sent them a bunch of little videos and sort of, you know, no, 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 I want to like this. And, you know, one detail that was pretty complicated is, you know, as a hand crafter, I'm using a French fillet tooth iron, you know, and I'm hand creasing all, all the lines. I like that detail. It adds value to my weird brain. And they're like, yeah, but like in a production sense, I don't really know how we're going to be able to do that, et cetera. So we had to do a little bit of MacGyvering and innovating, but it was good fun. So like our clicker press forms are actually heated. So it, it clicks and it does that embossing detail in one move so you know again like learning you know being steadfast in maintaining the principles and the ethos and the details and then learning how to make that work in a production sense um, was a fun challenge good experience and we got there now i just need to find customers for the work well yeah that first piece finding the manufacturers to your standards which is super uncommon today uh, it is a huge challenge but the story is so fascinating it the unfortunate events leading you to these but that's days. life right it's you just have to stay open yeah i think uh, well i'm quite spiritual a little bit you know freak on this side not not religious but with all this um i think we you can reach out, put out man. right we, what is that you get what you put out. Exactly. Like you're I'm all about leader, energy and karma. It's yeah. so strong your passion. You want this thing. You see it so clearly in your vision. And somehow you draw these things to your life. You know, that that owner recognizes you when you're walking by. Like what what are the chances you are at the same time walking by at his booth, right? So yeah, these crazy. are things I think you unknowingly make it happen and then it leads to this point. So it's great to hear that you finally found who can actually uh, uh, realize your dream into a physical product, which is impossible as we, we touch on a little bit in US. So the second part of the challenge is now finding the people, getting that in front of the people. I think in the past, uh, it was done through physical stores, which was challenging in a different way. If, if you're a little guy, trying to get into this craft, you know, you can't go rent an expensive store and get your products in front of people. Today, 
it's different. It's easier. You know, you can open an Instagram account, of course, or Etsy shop, whatever, to put your item in front of everybody. But then there's another paywall, which everybody and any platform that gets big enough starts building that paywall. It becomes pay to play. Now, it's easy to open the shop, but it's not easy to get the eyeballs to look at that your shop. So And the red eyeballs. So, for example, I don't think I'd ever put J Ward on Etsy because for at least from my personal perspective, Etsy's there's zero curation. It's no, no, there is like there whatever is you got, bring it in. And now the amount of just garbage that shows up in even a very specific search as a consumer, because I use it to hunt down like vintage buttons and textiles and blankets and stuff. Um, or I've bought many like vintage leather jackets. I, I love doctor's bags and like I'm trying to master traditional like conductor coin purse doctor's bag. So I'll buy vintage ones, tear them apart, understand how they're made, remake it with new leather, use all the way better than the modern crap hardware, you know, all the lasp and catch details, just phenomenal. And I like give it away to a friend or to my wife or what have you. But I think for a, a higher end product, it, there's a, very vast race to the bottom on Etsy. Yeah. And, and social media is hard too, because if a brand has a specific ethic or language or priority that isn't look over here, look how cheap I am. It's so difficult to communicate and educate the consumer. I do think less so in, in, in high end leather goods, but I've seen in many sectors that I've played in or I have friends that are in, there is a pushback from the consumer more and more that's created this wonderful revival of craftsmanship that we've seen globally where people go, you know, I'm not going to go to the big box store and buy a $20 backpack. I, I did that and it fell apart in a month or two months. And ethically, I don't like the energy costs or whatever their, their green reason or what have you. People are now more apt to say, all right, I'll spend 200 bucks on a backpack or 600 bucks or whatever, whatever their tolerance is, but they, they demand accountability, story, unique design, and like that there's humans behind it who give a damn. But again, back to the old paywall game, it, it, it's as that revival got empowered, the digital marketplace has made it in the last year alone, I'd argue, especially, um, or even since like first quarter of 24, I've noticed a significant decrease. And it's, it's, it's a new challenge. And like you said, like brick and mortar, I originally wanted to do direct to consumer only. Now I'm starting to feel like, okay, well, maybe I do wholesale to key specific, precise retailers that match the quality of what I want to put out. And like, if someone sends me an opportunity, offers me something or calls me or emails or whatever, even if like no way in hell, not in my wheelhouse, not my thing, I'm not interested at all. I don't know. Maybe I'm old, 54. I reply. I've been appalled how many luxury retail buyers you know, the buyers for these retail entities don't even answer. No communication. And I think that's sad. And in, in like in modern culture, even if it's a no, well, give me details. No, I, we, I just don't think your design language is a match for our customer base. Or no, this is absurdly too expensive. Or wow, the craftsmanship's amazing, but we pretty much thematically only do this colorway. Or, you know, whatever. But that openness to share and communicate I've been really shocked. Um, I've had a, a couple wonderful brands that I think are perfect for me that I am in communication with, and I'm excited to see that go and grow. But, you know, like like we we keep introducing these, you know, these are new hurdles or new challenges. And I like part of me wonders from like, do I need a rep, like hire a rep? But to me, that's impersonal. And like with my car brand, I've never had dealers or reps because I don't want the story lost. All my brands are very specific in the details and the nuances and how we execute. 
and I don't know if a rep's really going to get it. So I'm, I mean, I'm still in this process. Unfortunately, on this podcast, I'm not the uh, guy with all the wisdom to tell you how to do it. And I wrote the book. I'm, I'm literally in the middle of that struggle. But it's pretty well, interesting. I don't think anyone knows the answer, and it's it's a. I was hoping lengthy, you did. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> it's a lengthy process. You gotta um, kind of figure out on your own, and it depends a lot of with your goal, uh, with your vision, product, everything. But um, some of the things you mentioned now, social media becoming those paywalls because now they built enough traffic into their system. Just like a, a mall 30, 40, 50 years ago or, or a fancy street, now they can charge high rents because they have the eyeballs or the, or the foot traffic, right? Now the Instagram and Facebook and you know whatever platform you might want to tell your story has the same concept. Well, we have the eyeballs. We built the attention. Now we're going to sell that to you that unless you're paying, um, it's not going to work. But there is an alternative because these platforms are not creating the traffic themselves, they rely on content creators to create that interesting pool. I think one thing, you, you, there is like little dots we match together as small creators here, maybe leverage that point, put that personality, put your story, which is super unique in, in your case, you know, you have a lot to tell, like everything you told so far, it's, it, it's fun to hear. And other thing you mentioned, people are looking for people behind the brand and, and, and mindset behind the brand, that story behind the brand, instead of that corporate facade, nobody wants to see that polished commercial anymore. They want to hear the passionate story of the craftsman and idea yeah. behind it. So I think there is still a chance and which is what I'm trying to learn and realize for my own personal brand. You know, tell your story, tell what you're passionate about, share and help to, to the consumer and the industry. And then in return, they they respect and, and trust you, come back to your brand. It's kind of a slow growth. I found successful for my brand so far the most, but the alternative is, you know, pay uh, to play on these platforms. Well, like I get it, right? They're, they're, they're a business. If it's a business, they're there to make money. That's the nature of capitalism. What I'd love to see, and there was actually a very interesting, um, podcast I listened to recently that uh, was basically a rebroadcast of a uh, talk given by the founder of Patreon at South by Southwest, which is like a, oh, you know, big Texas music festival in Austin. And it was very interesting. He was saying, you know, you had web 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and talking about this growth and transition and saying exactly what you and I are saying, where it's become much more difficult for the creator. And then with the, the Patreon platform, which I, I don't, I don't use, I, I'm aware of it. He's now trying to create marketplaces and uh, channels to to create and distribute. But he's only, like, I listened to the whole thing. I was so excited. I'm like, okay, what are you cooking up? It was all digital products. I'm like, ah, what about us tangible, like physical, I don't know, people like I wish, because he's got the right headset. So I think you nailed it, though, is that without quality content creators, they don't have the scale to monetize it. But just like in American politics these days, the pendulum arcs are unhealthily wide. That pendulum needs to hang out a little closer to viable center, right? right? So I think if they can figure out a way to balance the quality content with their financial model, then they're onto something. If it's all about monetization, People are going to bail from the platform and they're going to suffer from it. It's just a question of when they acknowledge that and how they address or don't address that. But like my automotive brand, at first I was putting, when I was hand making everything I was selling, I just sneak it in my automotive Instagram feed, not even my face, just my Instagram. But I'd like, I have like almost 200,000 followers. I had a wait list, like months long wait list when I started doing apparel design, ditto. Everything I made would sell like immediately. Then I was like, oh, this is kind of unprofessional for an automotive feed doing all this. So I'm like, all right, I need to like put on my big boy pants and like create separate feeds and sites for each entity. Wow, that sucks. Now, I, you know, now I'm maintaining three different brands, feeds and content 
while really wanting to be focused on making stuff because that's my happy place. And starting from scratch today for followers is difficult. But again, since like January, even the Icon Forex 4 feed on Instagram, it's like 190, I think 180 some thousand followers. But when I look at the professional dashboard, like I'm reaching a single digit percentage of my followers. Right. They want me to pay to reach the audience I created. And, th and that I think is where I start to get a bit pissy and butthurt. Cause like, wait a minute, I organically built these followers. I didn't buy followers. They're, they're tribal, they're, they're engaging. And now you're not even letting them see it unless they manually search it down. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It is it is definitely getting tougher and tougher. It like like everything that um the trade-off. Now it's easy to take a photo of your thing and put it out in the world, but then who's gonna see it because everybody can do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, and then like if it's if it, if it's an expensive good and it's all about the detail. When people see it on social, it's a fleeting, you know, inch and three quarter, whatever, like little image. And like you said, I'm all about telling the story and like communicating what matters, and what what differentiates us. And I can I can geek out and get down to the finest, stupidest detail on anything I make. Like we can play pin the tail on the donkey, blindfold you, and you know, and have wherever your finger falls on my apparel, my leather goods, or my cars, oh, I can bore your brains out with details of why that element exists and why we did it the way we did it. But if they're throttling back, it's, it's so much harder to reach. So I've started doing like little events, like the right demographic, like art craft fairs, although they sound cheesy, if they're in the right locale or produced and or produced by the right team, the right audience finds them. Um, I did a recently did an event, very low cost to do. And it was a rodeo, but like beautifully curated everything down to the barrel racers and the ropers, like not just the rodeo, but the food and what artists were there and, and what they had. And it was phenomenal. I sold like three things, but I spread the word. I got my name, got the message. Yeah. And, and I am a believer in like, I just keep making stuff, even if it's not selling. I just keep making it. As long as I have the cash to front load fund it. But I th I think my word of caution for makers who are entertaining this transition that I'm going through with the leather goods collection, don't quit your day job. No. Keep this as a side hustle. Keep your overhead down. Make sure your language is, make sure you understand the priorities of what you're doing. Like I recommend writing and I've done for all my ventures, like what are your 10 commandments? And you need to be able to ask yourself with everything you make for, for that brand, the answer needs to be hell yeah or F no. It has to meet your core beliefs. If the DNA of the brand is firmly established, yeah, you're going to have to sing and dance and hustle and hustle. And it could happen overnight. It could take for a long time. But keep your day job, keep your focus. Stay committed, keep passionate, but I do think you have to get to a certain point of critical mass before you can really take the leap without taking other people's money to take the leap, which scares the we hell out of me. I don't recommend either. Oh God, no. I've never done it. I've got a, I had got a small business affairs loan. I got a second on my house. I threw every dime I made with the automotive brands right back into them and didn't even take salary for years, but I got to, a, I mean, not there. I'm, I'm not rich and retired and just making stuff that I want to make for myself and giving it to my friends, but you know, I, I have a good life, but you know, it, it, it's, you know, in some cases it's you know, we're talking 25 years of brand. Absolutely. Very great, great advice that not quitting the job or taking the money. This is going to take time. Like if you're passionate, it's going to take time. Um, definitely, but focused. don't, don't be a tramp. No, don't cut corners to meet what you think the market will tolerate. Because at least from, from my perspective, two things occur. One, then you're in that race to the bottom with everyone else who has the same mindset. And if you live in a Western or most European 
communities, your cost of living is such, you're never going to win at that game. And you're going to lose the passion for what you do, at which point you're probably dispassionate about your day job that's already paying you. Then just stay there. Like you, so it's that the passion that drives you is the most important thing to protect, I think. Like, you know, we were talking about Leon. To yeah, me, it's so sad. Like the tanneries are, they're consolidating, they're growing, they're meeting ISO and you know, clean initiatives. And the quality is getting so good. I mean, I'd say at this point, it's globally competitive. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Not with the top the 10%. The tannery side, I I loved what I've seen in Leon. Last year was the first time around this time I've been there. I love the professionalism, the leather quality, you know, and what. It's really good. It's so impressive. I've, and I've been there many times over the last five years and, and been able to see a marked, chartable growth of quality and perfection and, and, and professionalism. Um, however, on the flip side, I feel that the, 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 the final stitch goods makers, Mexico is making a run for Asian manufacturers. So the craftsmanship is less and less and less important. It's now about the cheapest possible manufacturing. And if, again, they're never going to win at that game. And it's so sad in a culture, right? That is generations of expertise and, and skill sets and like the most odd little niche in the leather space. There's a family that rocks that, you know, but now the younger generations are like, they're seeing what's happening. They're like, why would I do that? You know, I, I'm going to go be a bartender at uh, Cabo San Lucas and I'm going to make more money. So right. the young people are not really, I think quite wisely, it's sad, but I see what they're seeing. Like, why do I want to get into that and be a, a minion in a production house doing just churn and burn when it, the art of the craft exactly. is not being honored and revived? Yeah. And I think America is actually facilitating or incentivizing this this drive in Mexico. As far as I've seen, um, some of the biggest brands that are you know growing really fast in the U.S. has this fast fashion mindset almost even in leather portland leather goods is the perfect example for this one i know they started as a etsy shop and they are insanely big today as far as i heard or read like 100 million dollars over 100 million dollars a year sales but wow. when you look at the prices and the quality i reviewed a bunch of their bags i've been to facilities producing their bags in mexico i know the tanneries giving them leather many tanneries in leon so it's almost impossible pricing. Like it's insanely low replicating that fast fashion model. It's $60 bag, $70 bag. Is it leather? Yes, it is leather. You know, it's, it's yeah. coming from one of those yeah. good, good tanneries. It's not the best leather, but it is leather. But in terms of craftsmanship, it's absolutely quickest. Every corner cut, you know, the cheapest thing you can churn out. And I've seen them, like they're producing tens of thousands of them in the workshops in front of my eyes in Leon. And that is nothing about craftsmanship or, or you know, good leather working. But people have to do it because this is one of the biggest job givers in the, in the city today. And it derives everything. It derives the culture. It shapes the mindset and it gives them money. And American market rewards it. Now they the uh, the company is growing they're selling more and more stuff so um i don't know it's 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 interesting for them to focus on the quality or improve their game as well when this is the dynamic in the market yeah and um i i i I'd, I'd, I'd hope for a future where there's space for both um so if it's entry level disposable looks chic that week falls apart next month uh i think uh if we care about the planet, that is a dangerous path. Same with all these BS, you know, safe leathers, vegan leathers. Oh my God. Leathers. It's all a crock. They're all petroleum substrates. They don't last. So they don't have the touch. They don't, they're not respecting the byproduct story. And I know that's a big rant for you. So I'll spare listeners taking us down that rabbit hole yet again, but I'd like to still think there's uh, a space and it's going to require digital support where we can reach audiences telling that story. 
um, for that growing consumer that, you know, maybe they can't afford all of it, but they respect the craft. I mean, my cars are horrendously expensive. Probably 95% of my followers just appreciate the art of them and maybe buy a t-shirt from us, but they can't afford. My cars are like a quarter mil to a million plus. But it's the community that is so valuable. And who knows, it's been six months later, six years later, six days later, that person's talking to their boss who is in my customer base and their passion from my passion, I put out and communicated to them. They become advocates, they become ambassadors. And it always leads to growing the tribe, even just followers and fans, um, ideally consumers. But I, th I think that the, the digital landscape's at a transition point that um, is, I don't have the answer. And that's like my big challenge of what to do there. Absolutely. Well, g great insights. I think um, one thing I'm trying to uh, derive from my experience, the common sense in a lot of crafters or marketers is one of the biggest fallacy points. You know, uh, if you're trying to focus making your product cheaper, believing that it's going to attract more customers and stuff like that. It's a race to the bottom, which leads to no good to anybody. And, you know, you get tired and get out of the game very quickly. So you got to do what common sense, like opposite of what common sense says, you know, stick with your passion. Like, okay, common sense. I feel like if I make this cheaper, probably I'm going to get more customers. So I'm going to make the opposite of it. I'm going to stick with what I believe the best. I'm going to make it more expensive, you know, in good reasons for quality and everything. Stick with your story. Put your face and passion out there telling the story. That's probably going to keep you in the game and grow in the long run. Probably it's not going to happen over overnight, but that's what I see like it's working the best for me. I couldn't agree more. Um I'm, I'm questioning like there's erosion and how well that works with some of the contemporary challenges, but I honestly don't, that's my happy place. Uh, I have to respect why I'm doing it and protect that. And if that means I make a compromise in the scalability, so be it. But you know, it's, it's frustrating when serendipity and karma or whatever has awarded me and rewarded me. And this manufacturer can scale like crazy scale and like, all the ducks are in line. So I just secured my first retailer and they have locations in Aspen, Jackson Hole, Northern California, Los Angeles, and New York City. And they're carrying just my wallets and flasks, but that's a nice start. Right. And then uh, engaging in some conversations with some, some bigger reach distributors or retailers to carry the whole line. And we'll see how it goes. But man, they like their margins. Ouchie. Yeah, that, you know, Every channel, every decision has has the trade off. Again, but I look, you know that trade off, right? If if uh, if wholesaling to them means I'm barely making ten percent, right? I made ten percent, right? And when I go to reorder, instead of ordering two hundred, if they're moving units, I can order four hundred or five hundred or whatever multiple. Then my per unit price goes down because my manufacturer. I front loaded, funded it, you know, as far as tooling and efficiencies in the process of making it. And they're like, no, as you go up, like we've been all supply, we'll drop the price as you increase the scale. So I'm just chomping at the bit to find that scale. Right. But that's, that's one way it could work. And that's, you know, kind of a shortcut because you can afford it um, to do that. And through their network, your work gets in front of the per person in their hands, which is one of the biggest unique aspects of leather goods. You know, there's only so much you can communicate online yes. about the feeling of leather. They need yeah, to I gotta smell it, and feel it, and study the details. Yeah. Maybe that's the cost you're paying to get in the hands of the consumer to yeah. prove your story. What you're saying is true. And then they're going to come back by from your website. So it's, it's not all that 10%, I think there's more to that in the future. It's an investment. That's why I'm time to time considering that option as well. But uh, I think it's it's a good way to keep in your marketing and distribution plan. Yeah. 
And you you asked a question earlier, and I talked too much, so I started blabbing about it. I answered your question, but another key point to it is, you know, what brought me to leather work specifically or apparel? Like, I've always geeked out on details on anything made well. It doesn't matter. It's just the way I'm built. But if you think about it, what drew me to transportation was it is an extroverted, cohesive combination of so many art forms woodworking, there's textile design, there's leather, then add to that durability, utility, and a cohesive design that brings all these art forms together in, 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 a, in a tangible, extroverted, useful product that many people love. That was natural for me. And the, the leather work coming back to it and, and really further developing my skills in it was really about more getting back to hands-on, which I had communicated. But, but transportation is such an amazing combination. So many art forms or so many ways to pour out art forms, depending on how big your company is or how you look at it. True. Um, well, it, cars are fascinating to me. I think I would be intimidating to ever try to get into designing a car because of all that complexity, you know, how many art forms and material knowledge and skills that you need to have to. I think the designing is actually, at least for me, seems easier because you're just respecting your perspective and you're either, you have that skill set or you don't. The engineering, a whole different party. Then engineering the production to repeat it consistently of the same quality cost effectively then training the crew, making sure they understand your ethics and what's important to the brand. That's a whole different thing. And that takes a village. I mean, I have a significant team here and I focused, you know, I call it a master alliance, which I stole from a 1930s business writer, Napoleon Hill. Very interesting. Oh, yeah, I know. I love it. It was one of my favorite. Books. So master alliance, right? Build a team. Ideally, you know, for years, my wife and I, it was five, six days seven days a week it was from payroll to payroll freaking out right and then we had to do everything that experience was important and it was valuable and most importantly i think when we got to the point of relative growth and success it allowed us to sit down and write a list of all the things we have to do to run the business which unfortunately everyone eventually realizes most of it has nothing to do with the craft or the art of the product you actually went in to do. And then I was able to go, okay, which of these hats actually fit me? Or do I actually think I look good? And even if I don't circle those, okay, keep those. Those are me. All right. Spreadsheets, budgeting, production analysis. Yeah. I suck at all that. So I need to build out a team that is, doesn't have my skill sets, but has their own together. We're all stronger in chorus and it's allowed us to to build and grow the company and i'm so happy i did that and it was painful in the beginning i mean that first leadership level person you know they their salary was pretty crazy and it was a major roll of the dice um but the, you get the right people the paybacks come yep absolutely well it's i think this is more like a talk on entrepreneurship and how to build a company it was but an insanely important experience very difficult things to do um perhaps if anybody who's trying to build a leather business here it's gonna get to the same point you're gonna have to decide what you can or want to do and why you have to delegate and build the teams and make sure they're doing it in the right way better than you and all that stuff um so it's definitely not easy it's it doesn't end with designing and crafting a product if you want to turn it into a business yeah, but look, if, if you add someone to the team and they're poison in the soup or the flavor changes, got to let them go and move on and keep striving. Yeah. But at the flip side, I can't count the number of times friends or people in industries I love that I've seen be control freaks and not want to delegate anything. Sometimes for seemingly just reasons. Oh, I hired a bookkeeper and she was stealing money from me. Well, then what? So you're never going to hire one again? Are you going to try and do the books that you suck at because you're a creative type? Like, they try and do everything, and, and it, 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 that's not sustainable. Yeah, even just emotion. 
but skill wise, you're you're gonna burn out. Yeah, it doesn't work. You, you burn out. You limit yourself. You can't grow. Well, it, it could be a choice. You don't want to grow. It's fine. Um, I read a book which was very impactful um, for my decision making. It's called Company of One. Uh, I don't remember the author, but it's very interesting. So today it could be a a choice. You know, you're making this leather brand, and you don't want to get to that level of complexity and managing people, hiring people. You can make that decision. As long as you have paying customers and you're improving your product, you can keep upping your prices if you can't keep up with that until you maximize your limit and stay there, generating better and better revenue for yourself and for your smaller team and be happy with it. You know, you, there, it, It's not a rule that you have to grow and have a factory and a team of people. That's also an option. And I think a lot of people are following the traditional American dream of bigger is better and I have to scale, scale, scale. And I totally agree with you. That's that's not the modern path to success, and especially spiritual success and work life family balance. Like sometimes enough is good enough, and like you know, probably the some of them unhappiest humans I know are billionaires. You know, yep. now some of the unhappiest humans I know are flat broke and worrying about paying rent and feeding themselves. So. I'm not saying that's a one channel thought, but money doesn't buy taste nor happiness nor balance. Right. And I think that's something we we culturally or even education we're misguided to think that's the path. And and I I definitely uh think people should push back and really have more of an introspective, deep conversation with the two parrots on each side of your brain to to figure out which one to chop its head off and which one to, to feed. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this is um, great insight again. I I should get one of your bags and um, do a dissection review soon. Um, I, I I will I'll look up on the calendar after this talk and try to find a, a time, the one to get and do the, the review. I'm really curious because all the things, little details you're passionate about i see i want to see all that stuff you know i'm 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 a big op- opponent of the edge paint i love the turned seams you know that that ripped uh wrapped edges and all that stuff or burnish so i would like to see that old style stuff from a brand it could be, it would be refreshing Bring it on. I would love that. And you're a great example of poking the veneer of modern luxury right in the eyeball where it deserves it. So I'd I'd be partially sad to watch one get torn apart, but I'd love for you to see the depth of consideration and the details. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that as soon as possible. Um, And to give people a chance to see what you do in not only leather, probably the, the priority is leather, as most people interested watching this is in leather. Where can they find your products, collections, where they can purchase it online, offline, and other things you create as a you know multiple entrepreneur? Yeah. Okay. Let me try and not drag this out too long. So cars, watches, and the leather goods collection can all be found on the Icon website, which is Icon. 4x4.com. And then the Leather Goods Collection has a standalone website that is J Ward Collection. Same with Instagram. And then campfirecoats.com and campfirecoats on Instagram. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, I will go check it out and I recommend people to check it out uh, give it a try. We will do a, an in detail uh, review and depth. Of course, independently, I will buy it so I don't have to. Uh, feel like I have to say good things about it. So <laughs> that's kind of it. Well, I mean, at least let me give you a discount and you still should feel good if, you know, whatever, we'll sort it out. Sure. And I'm here to help and I, I love what you're doing. You know, before we wrap it up, I have a question for you. Yeah, absolutely. Is your real name Tanner Leatherstein? No, of course not. <laughs> okay. I, I would love it to be. Uh, hey, I've seen crazier stuff happen. I, I had a friend in high school whose parents owned a, candy bar factory and the kid's name was candy and the family last name ready drum roll bar really wow. yes that 
that's my dream come through for for a different industry i think uh here's how i explain it this would be the name if we chose our own names and last names when we knew why we are here in this world so wow that's a cool concept i'm gonna have to chew on what my reply would be to that i gotta give that one some thought probably be first name serial last name craftsman if, if i had to like make a quick decision that would fit because the quickest <laughs> decision comes from your inner mind that knows you yep. the best so i think uh, that's the explanation my real name is vulcan it's um turkish for volcano um but once i got this insane clarity on why am i here on this world i decided to use that as a personal brand on social media so brilliant Awesome. Well, this was so much fun, um, Jonathan. We appreciate all the experience you shared here, insights. I think it's going to be helpful so to so many entrepreneurs trying to figure out their own ventures. Um, I sure hope so. And I'd love it to be a conversation. Like if, if they think we're wrong or they have other ideas or they have questions, feel free to reach out. I, I mean, that you know, that's something too, that the leather community you know, fashion, forget about it. No one will share any information. Won't help you with nothing. It's such a dog eat dog. Right. High end custom automotive space, eh, fairly friendly to a point. We we all most there's a couple devils, but most of us are open and support one another in an appropriate manner. Nothing matches the leather craft world. For a right. sense of openness, camaraderie, and community. I mean, down to when I made my first horrible wallet or whatever the heck it was and i was posting um like serious baller high-end makers were like taking the time to send me a list of their favorite tool supplies or to make little videos to show and help me how to saddle stitch better and on and on and on and you know it's, it's there's it's such a lovely community and it and it's um unfortunately quite quite rare it seems it is, it is, but it's so pleasant to be part of that. Uh, literally, there's nothing you can you can't ask to someone and get a very transparent answer. You know, making you ceramics work. seem to be equally kind. My wife's uh, big into ceramics, and it, it all su suppliers, makers, whatever, like everybody involved in that industry. Uh, there's a comparable culture there. It's like nice to see. Yeah, this is, this is great. Well, thanks for sharing your insights. I'm sure it's going to be helpful um, to fellow entrepreneurs. And if anybody, again, wanted to add something or contradict with whatever we said or you said, feel free to add it in the comments, send us an email. Uh, we will love to keep the conversation going. So, Beautiful. Thank you so much again. We'll put all the accounts and websites so people, if they want to reach out to you, they can. And we will stay in touch. I, I really enjoy talking to you. I'm sure I'm going to have questions and probably we'll see each other again, talk talk to each other again. I hope so. Cheers. I'll connect with you by your dinner next time I'm in Texas. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Anytime, Dallas, just let me know. Um, I'll be more than happy to hear all these stories in person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.